I do want to mention that when Dan is done, if when you come up, just be careful. He's got to clean this up. All this has to go back in his truck. So if we have some big, strong people. Okay. All right. So tonight we have Dan Henry. He's going to be doing a demo with his ornamental lathe. Dan Henry has been a member of our club for many, many, many years. A long time. And a member of the Hunt County Club. The first one I remember a few years ago, you actually made your own lathe? Yes, is I did. Is this one you made? Or one no, th this was made by Martin Strand. It is, belongs to Sammy Thompson. Sammy allowed me to, to borrow it for this demonstration because it's portable. So this is a home-built home lathe, and it's the, you can buy one or get one, make one. However you want to do it. However you want to do it. But we're going to let Dan talk about it, and he knows this much better than I do. Okay. Dan, take it away. All right. I've been turning for since 95, I believe, was the first time I turned a pin, and I turned pins for a while because that's all I know how to do. And then occasionally things come along, come along. In 07, there was an article in the AAW Journal about uh, this lathe made out of MDF wrote by John McGill. There was two articles, one how to build it and one how to operate it. Well, I worked on airplanes for 40 years, and I thought I was kind of mechanically inclined, and I'd be damned if I could figure out how that thing worked. So that year, I went to the symposium in Portland, Oregon, and the first session was how to build it. It was very informational. And then John fired that thing up and started making ships, and I said, oh, my goodness. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it. And I did. Uh, we drove out there, and I thought about it all the way home. And with a lot of help, I made a MDF lathe. And it had some problems, but yet it was a pretty functional lathe. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat, and that was just one of them. I'll talk a little bit more of that later on. Uh, what I want to cover tonight is a little brief history of ornamental turning and some of the different lathes that's out there, past and present, some of the parts of the lathe, and I'm going to do a short demo on how it actually works. Let's show some pictures, Ken. You ready? <laughs> Whatever, you just show them and I'll talk about them. Okay, this is a picture of my lathe. It is a Lindell White, and it has a steel top, and it has a crossing wheel. And the crossing wheel is this part that has the, right behind the big round disc, it's got uh, eight rosettes on it, so you can change from rosette to the next one. Go to the next one, Ken. And you see the overhead drive, which looks an awful lot like this. This here, go back to the, go back. You, you had it there. Okay. Go back. That's the other end of, the, of my lathe at home. Okay, this here is the MDF lathe that I built for myself. And also at that time frame, we built one for the DAW, and it didn't it get used as much as I thought it would. Um, this lathe did a lot of things that the original Lindell White machine wouldn't do, but it still it was, had some limitations to it. Okay, the next picture. Okay, go to the next one. We've seen that one. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, it, you just have it's just the other end of it. It's just you can see the uh, overhead drive, and it's uh, the overhead drive is just like this one here. And we'll talk about the overhead drives and, and all these posts. Yeah, okay. Okay, go, go to the next one, Ken. Go to the next one. You didn't get the rest? Okay. All right, well, the other one was, was a picture of a hose apple lathe. Uh, the hose apple lathe was originally built back in the late 1800s, early 1900s by this guy named of Jacob Hoseapple. And he was a German who went to England to do his craft. And he built over 2,400 different lays, and none of them was built exactly the same. It's just whatever the person who was buying it, whatever they wanted, that's what he made. But they said that you couldn't take a screw out of one machine and put it in another lathe because every screw was handmade for that installation. So, but could you imagine what kind of tools they had back in the late 1800s and the 1900s to, to build something like that? You know, maybe a file. I don't know what kind of tooling they had. It, it just... 
it's amazing, you know, you can build about anything you want to with a CNC today, but doing it all by hand was, was quite a feat. Uh, <clears throat> the, the ornamental turning back in the 15, way back in the 1500s, it actually was in, in existence. And most of the, what was do, people doing at that time was kings and princesses that princes that had a, a, almost a slave who was a dedicated turner. And that's all they did was turn to, the, to, their, to their master's uh, desires. Uh, some of the hose out, lays that was available, or has been available, was the hose apple, the Evans, the field, the plant, the lower, and a clare. And they're all old ones still out there today. But up until this recent, on the last 10 years, the only way you could get into ornamental turning is you had to find one of these old lays, probably overhaul it, and teach yourself how to operate it, because there was not much activity uh, going on with the ornamental world. Uh, Steve White and Dave Lindau, Steve is a aircraft machinist and David is a clockmaker. They got involved with ornamental turning, and they was at a symposium, and they said, hey, why don't we get together and build a lay? Then they did, and that's where the Lindau machine come from. And it, it's a very, very useful and very uh, can do about anything with it. And they have made a wonderful uh, lot of gadgets to put onto it to do a lot of different things. They, uh, David and three other guys have got together and made what they call a made lay. This stands for their initials. And right now it's going for about 100 grand. But it is a piece of art. It's, it's all mahogany and brass, and it's really got some wonderful features to it. It's, it is pretty. You can put that in your living room and be proud to have it there, I think. Another one is a Mydell, which is kind of like this lathe, but it's not quite as useful as this lathe. Uh, John McGill's MDS lathe, which was done in 07, and this is, he was selling a parts kit, which was the metal pieces. You provide the MDF to make it. But he's no longer uh, making the kit. But all the drawings to make all the metal pieces and the, the MDF parts are available on the we AEW website. So if you're really interested in doing it, you can still find the information. There's a guy named John Armbruster. He is a ophthalmologist, I believe. He's an eye doctor. He made some Mark 8 lays. I think he made 24 of them, and they sold for about $36,000, and they are a work of art also. They're a very, very nice lay. They got a lot of mahogany and brass and look very nice. So if you ever hear of a Mark 8 for sale and you're interested, jump on it because there, there's not many of them out there. It's, it's a good lathe. I talked about some of the organizations earlier. The OTI, it's a, it's a Ornamental Turning International. It's a website. And the SOT in England. And the OTI has a symposium every other year. The next one will be 2020. And they have announced where it's going to be at. But the last, I've been to a couple, a couple of them, three of them. And they're very informational. They, you, you can talk with the people who do, makes a living doing this ornamental turning work, and they're freely with their information. That's, they're kind of like all the other wood turners out in the world. They are very free to, to share their ideas. And I think that's a wonderful thing to be part of a wood turning group, that, an artist that's willing to share their ideas. Because lots of folks in the arts and crafts business, if they tell you you're going to be as smart as they are, and they don't want to tell you. Uh, there's not a lot of books out there. Most everything you're going to find is things that's been written years ago. There is one by Warshaw, which was probably 15, 20 years ago, and it is somewhat understandable. Uh, Jacob Hosapple wrote four books, and if you look something, if you have insomnia, that'd be a good book to sit down and read because in about five, five pages, you're asleep because it's, it's in the King's English, and it's very difficult to read, I thought. In fact, I even looked at the pictures thinking I'll find something to go along with this picture, and I, I had trouble finding that. So I've read parts through them, but I haven't really read the whole thing. Uh, the, the people I think is probably responsible for the renewed interest in uh, ornamental turning is David Lindau, Steve White, and John McGill. I think they have did an awful lot. There's a lot of other people that probably better turners than they are, but they, got the, they made the machinery, and that's what it's all about. The Lindau machine is still available today. You can buy it in many different varieties, starting at about $4,000 all the way up to close to $20,000. You know, it depends on how deep your pockets are and, and what you want to do because there is a multitude of options and accessories you can put onto it. Okay, let's talk about the different parts of the lathe. Any questions at this point? And feel free to ask a question 
And, and I may defer the answer because I'm going to cover it later on, but if I'm not, I will t attempt to answer it. I'm not the expert at this. I've just been doing it a while and understand some of it. The headstock. Can you put the camera over here? You can say, okay. This is the, it's a headstock just about like your, your wood turning lathe is. It's got the shaft in it, and this has this big disc on it. Some lathes have holes drilled in this disc for an index plate, and I'll talk about indexing a little bit later. Uh, the hand crank is here. If you take this motor off, you can engage the hand crank, and you can crank it by hand. And there are some operations you, you really want to do it by hand, and some you want to use the motor. If you've ever tried to do something on a jointer or I mean, on a, a router, you know, when you're trying to run a piece through and you want to run it nice and steady, and if you're doing it by hand, you don't realize it, but you're doing it in jerks and splurts. And you, every time you stop a little bit, you have a possibility of having a little burn mark. And this is kind of the same thing. If you've got something that's powered, it's constant, and it, it, it's smooth. So and it, you don't have to sit here and crank all day long. Uh, this, this is the slow speed drive. It is nothing but a barbecue motor, but there's other, other ones out there. It's, it's quite more complex. You can engage them very easily, and they have a, a, ver a variable speed, so you can make their, your piece turn slower or faster. And there's times that's very important because if you've got something that's not turn cutting real well, you slow it down so your cutter can make more, make more passes at it. Okay, the rosettes. This here white thing on the end is a rosette. I've got several in this box here. There, there are in moon, several different patterns. At home, I have about 40 different patterns. I've used most of them, but not all of them. And they, they all make a, a design, but I, I something unique I'm going to show you in a minute about the rosettes. Uh, the, the, the touches or the rubbers. This here, can you go down to the here? This is a rubber, and it could be a roller like this, or it could be a solid piece, and if it's got a, a radius to it, can you go to the camera on the end? There you go. Okay, there you can see the, the, if you change the radius of the rubber, it changes your design because it doesn't go all the way into the valley or it maybe it does, it makes a different cut. And there's many different shapes of those. Cutting frames. This here is a cutting, this is a universal cutting frame. And what makes it universal is you, you loosen up this set screw right here. Go back to where he's at. Okay. Okay, you loosen this set screw right here, and you can rotate the head anywhere 90 degrees or anywhere in between. So that's what makes it universal. It has two little solid carbide cutters. They're little triangular-shaped cutters. They are, there's a sharp point on all three edges, so if one gets dull, you take that little bitty screw out and hope you don't lose it, and you, put, you just rotate it to the next cutting edge and you're back in business. There's two of them. They're cutting exactly at the same level. There is another cutter that I have. It has a, just a solid rod, a solid carbide cutter, and you can cut them into different profiles to cut different profiles. But they're, so, they're carbide, so it takes diamond to, to shape them. Okay, the next thing is a tool post. This item right here is a tool post, and it's, it's what's used to connect the, the cutter to the compound table. The below it is the compound table, and what makes it work nice is it precisionally moves this way and this way, and it's got a little dial on here, and it's, it's graduated in thousandths of an inch. We're not worrying about eighth of an inch or sixteenth of an inch. We're worrying about thousandths of an inch. A couple of thousandths makes all the difference to the world. What we're really doing is we're taking what a metal machinist would be doing, the precision and accuracy, and, and relaying it, putting it on wood. It's so if you don't like to be super precision, this isn't a thing for you. If you like precision work, this might be your, your calling. Okay, another thing is called a drill frame. This is a drill frame. Where are we at here? On the end here, Take this nut off, and you can put different collets in it. I have in here just an eighth inch, and it goes up to as high as three, six, three eighths of an inch. It's just a matter of taking it. You know, like a, your router has a collet. It's the same thing. It just it grips it, the shank all all, all sides. And this is it's got the the tool holder for the tool post, which goes or the, the holder for the tool post. Eccentric cutter. 
This is an eccentric cutter. And what this is used for, well, I didn't bring it. it. If you're going to do what they call a body corn, where you've got a series of little bitty circles all the way around your piece, this is what you do. You loosen this here screw on the side, and you can move this cutter in and out to a precision diameter of your little circle. They come in a couple of different sizes. A fly cutter. Where is my fly cutter? Well, I got it here somewhere. Well, I'll have to come back to it. I can't seem to find it. It's, it's supposed to be on this pile of stuff somewhere. Overhead drive. This here, what looks like a rubber band, is actually urethane belting. And this here, rotozip, which this is an excellent use for a rotozip if you have one, because I, I, using it as rotozip, I didn't have a lot of luck with it. But it runs 30,000 RPM. I have over here a router speed control from Harbor Freight that controls the, the RPMs out. It works very well. Uh, <clears throat> the auxiliary rosette holder, to lay the home I, in this area right here, I have a whole series of discs, and over here at the end, I can just change out one rosette at a time, just like this one here has. And I can also phase this here. I'll show you how that works in a minute. Okay, other things that you can have, uh, other accessories, is a threading jig. You can thread with, it with a, not, not this lathe, but my lathe, Linda White, I can make four different thread pitches very accurately, and they come out perfect every time. As a dome chuck, which allows you to do something like this. You see, there's, there's six little ro uh, uh, flowers in a, in a pattern there. And a dome chuck allows you to do something like that. A straight line jig, which allows you to, the, for the cutter to go straight up and down, it's used a lot for guilloche. Guilloche is, you see a lot of old watch faces that had a pretty little zigzag or different design on it. That was done as, as guilloche. You're using a little carbon tip cutter that's it's, it's actually just scratching the surface. It's only just a few thousands uh, deep. But you have to set your machine up very, very accurately because if you're off just a thousands, it's going to show. So it takes a long time to set it up. But it's, it's something you can do with it. A curvilinear allows you to make a piece. This one here has an oval, oval shape, if you can see that. You do the zoom, zoom out a little bit. Okay, this is an oval shape. Also, it has a taper to it. I put an oval dis disc on my machine, and that turned the oval size. Then I have a curvilinear that moved the cutter very carefully to following a profile to get the curved piece in it. It it's, takes a long time to do something like this. And, and we're all done here. If you want to come up and look at some of the other things that's been done on, different, on, on this machine and other machines, you're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, I talked something about phasing. What phasing is all about is, can you, just, can you zoom in here on this, this basco eth? Okay. Okay, I cut one row around this here, and, it, and I wanted to move it so that the point is in the valley. That's called phasing. I moved it 50%. Uh, uh, in relation to the the rosette to the wood. And then I cut another row and then I move it back and you just go back and forth and do that. Or you can keep going in a, sp in a spiral pattern and, and make a, what they call a chevron. I have done where you just keep step, step up to the center and then you step, step back and it's kind of a unique pattern. But it's, there is no one thing you can do or can't do. It's just a matter of your imagination. What you can think of it or you can see somebody that did something like it say, hey, maybe I can try that, you know. To me, you know, a lot of people get upset when you copy somebody's work, but I consider it a, a, a compliment because they thought enough of your piece to try to do it. Now, if they try to sell it as, as their work, I think it's a different story, but just to make one for themselves to see if they can do it, I think it's a, it's a, it's a compliment to do that. Any questions about the machine? What 
Well, this is considered a rose engine lathe because the rosettes resemble as a rose. A engine lathe, it does not have the rosette. It just moves in straight lines or indexes or uh, what's the reciprocator when you, you can, it's kind of like a ratchet affair. It is, there's, ornamental turning is kind of a broad term. I mean, it's, it means you did some ornamentation to your piece, and usually when the, in a situation like this, you did it very precisionly. You didn't hand carve it, but you, you did it so that the machine actually did your pattern. So it, it's uniform all the way around. It should not be any difference from one side to the other. That that answer the question? Well, the, the rocking is Rose engine. Right. Right. That's, that's what makes it all work is this rocking action. The, the, there's a spring over here. Could you see the spring? Okay, when you push it here, it, it pushes it, it, it push, lets it go over, but the spring pushes it back. And that causes the rosette to rub on the rubber, which, which controls this. Let me turn this on. You see the, the movement there? Well, that's gonna, the wood is moving the exact same because it's all hooked together. And the cutter is going to be stationary, and it's going to do the cutting. This cutter turns around eight to 10,000 RPMs. Uh, I, I checked it out at home and I think I got it set about the same spot. But the, the speed of the cutter makes a difference on your quality of your cut. You can get it too fast, it'll burn it, and you get it too slow and you won't have a smooth cut. And again, the speed of the uh, slow speed drive makes a difference on the cut also. If you could slow your, uh, your speed down of your uh, <coughs> power drive, it can make a smoother cut also. And also, when you, what I try to do is at the very end, last cut, I'll advance it maybe five thousandths of an inch or less so that that cutter, will, if it's fuzzed up, it'll take that away. Okay, sure. No, no, no. They're, they're just about everything is turned on a regular lathe to make it round. Even, even this here oval box, I went to the lathe and I turned a, I had a round piece this big around. Then I brought it over here and used the oval, oval rosette to make it oval with. So, it, so you, you, you're, you've got to be able to go back and forth. This machine here does not have a number two Morse taper. My machine at home has a number two Morse taper. And what that allows me to do is I have an adapter that my chuck screws onto. I put that into my wood turning lathe, turn my piece, and it's, it's round and true. And I bring it over here and put it in the mortise taper, and it's going to be very close to be round and true. There is a gadget called a leveling chuck that you can put between the headstock and the chuck, and it allows you to move the piece this way and slide it left and right. And you use a dial indicator to get that thing so when it goes around, it's perfectly round. It's not going in elliptical motion. Uh, back in my early days when I didn't, ha I had my MDF lathe. It had a solid shaft, no more taper. I was going to make a platter about that big around. Well, I used an inch eight uh, adapter on my big lathe, and I brought it over to the mortar metal lathe, and I started, boy, I'm all ready to go. I was going to do it all around the every platter. It's going to be pure, really beautiful. So I started cutting. It cut halfway around, and it quit cutting because the thing was off. The, the, the adapter I had was off, and my threads was off, and there were several things. And when you screw this on here, the threads are not as accurate as a mortise taper is going to be. It, it, you can get them cocked just a little bit. A machinist, somebody back here said he's a machinist, they will take a mallet, and they will tap that into being round, if you, if you can fix, pic, picture that, so, that you got a, so it's rotating perfect. But you use a dial indicator so you don't have that, that dial is deflected at all. It's, it's perfectly round. But the, since I've got the Morse taper, I very seldom use my uh, leveling chuck. I just don't need it. Any questions at this point? Okay, I'm going to do a little cut here. I'm going to make this, where are you at? Okay, I'm going to make this piece right here. And I'm going to show you a phenomenon It's kind of hard to understand, but it, it, it happens. That ring around the outside is cut with the exact same rosette with the exact same, it's a different cutter, but it's the same rosette setup. And I'm, I'm going to show you how it's done. Oh, these here? Sure. What you'll notice there, 
I'll, I'll explain that now. Oh, come on. I'm going to cut what I call on the left side of center. That's what this cut is right here. Okay, I go over to the right side of center and I get a different cut with the exact same rosette. That's kind of hard to believe, but that does happen. And, and you, you, this is, these are round, and over here they're pointed. And, and those, those will show the exact same thing. It just depends on which side of center that you turn it on. Okay, this is going to be a little bit noisy. I'm sorry for that. That's what the lasso is here is for. It didn't, it didn't break. Usually the belt breaks when it does that. Well, what in the heck happened here? Because that's what I got. Oh. Right there. The lasso is keeps it from bouncing around when it, when it comes belt comes off like that. It's not supposed to do that, but it, you know, you've heard of Murphy, haven't you? <laughs> do you? I can see it over here. Okay, you heard you hear that change in the pitch? That means I, the cut was done on uh, the, that depth was cut. So I'm going to advance it just a little bit more. One turn of this here moves the table fifty thousandths of an inch. One turn over here moves it fifty thousandths of an inch. You see how it's a little bit fuzzy? I'm going to move it about three thousandths and a lot of that fuzz will go away. Now if I had some good hardwood, that, that fuzz wouldn't be there. That's just because it's plywood. But I wanted something where you could stain it so you could see the, the pattern emerge. Yeah, you can see it out the other corner there. Is That's the rubber creating the, the rocking action. Okay, I moved it over three hundred thousandths. I moved this crank six turns. That's what all these are they like. These here, I went uh, uh, six three hundred thousands to get me another uh, flower. Because well, it's just it's it's just growing, right? The pattern the pattern is basically the same. It just grows as as the diameter gets bigger. Okay, I'm going to go in just a little bit more.
Here's the fly cutter I couldn't find a little bit ago. Where are you at? Okay, that's the fly cutter. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate that in just a minute. This is spinning at roughly 8,000 RPMs. This is a, a little piece of solid carbide. It's sharpened very sharp, and su surprisingly in wood, they last quite a while. Okay, I got a little ring there, which I didn't plan on, but it's, it gives it another little detail that to adds, add character to it. Uh, what else is something that's kind of easy to do is you take a piece of wood that's maybe an eighth of an inch thick and you glue some veneers to it, some different colors of veneers, and then you cut down through them veneers and it makes a really a pretty pattern. And it's pr pretty easy to do. Okay, now we're going to do something altogether different. I'm going to leave the same setup. I'm going to change the cutter. Now this one here, it's very easy to change the direction of the rotation of this here. Just twist the belt. Now it's going to go the other way around. What's in here, for a machinist, this is a number one starting drill. And the cutter there is about 364 of an inch. Very, very small. I'm cutting on the right side of center. See, it's making points rather than round. It's almost like magic. I've got a brush here somewhere. Hmm. <laughs> That's what we just did. Okay. Well, I'll try not to. I was going to take a couple of minutes here, so don't get excited. Yeah, you, you go ahead and tell jokes if you got them. Smoke them if you got them. Plastic, metal, brass, aluminum. I guess you could turn steel. It's pretty hard on cutters. But if you're using solid carbide cutters, they'll cut the, the ferrous metals very nicely. Uh, or Corian or any kind of the plastics. Uh, I've seen some uh, acrylic boxes where they've turned the inside of it and you look through it and it's really got a very pretty flower because it's, it's, because of the way it's turned, it gives you that three-dimensional look to it. Um, I, I, there's cast and extruded and one turns better than the other, and I never can remember which was cast turns better than extruded. But for some reason, just the way it's made up. Have you tried doing, like, um, last month, didn't we have Gary Sanders here with the layered veneer? Rosette, or the layered veneer? Y yes, yes, I've done that. Yeah, it was a different color. 
Sure. You just take you a little thicker piece, a, a, a nice base, and glue you a couple of different uh, contrasting c colors to it. I don't have, I don't, well, this, this is sort of like that. This little box right here is actually three layers of wood. That was turned, I had to turn the cylinders on a metal lathe so that they fit together perfectly. Because you, when you start cutting down through, you don't want to see a void. So this was uh, uh, turned on a metal lathe, glued together with epoxy. It looked very ugly until you got it all cleaned up and then turned the inside. And there's a, there was a flower down inside, one in the bottom. Same thing with the top. There's a flower. And this is a piece of black wood, the little knob. And there's a little fine detail. There you see it. And that was cut with that same cutter in a 24 bump rosette. So the, the rosettes will do quite a bit of different things. And especially when you throw in different radius of rubbers, it changes your cut. Because the cut is, the rubber is not going all the way to the bottom of the, of the valley of the rosette. The, well, the, the rosette, I mean the sure, rubber, the, the rubber in a rosette, yes, the way, the way they match. Uh, when John McGill first made his MDF lathe, it came with two rosettes. One was 12 bump, I believe, and the other was kind of a square, and they said if you used all the different combinations you could possibly do, it would take you several years to do them all. It was just that many complications. Uh, you can also put a a flat r uh, rubber on the end here and it just goes across the bumps and it, it, it's, it's what they call fading is you're not allowing the rubber to go all the way to the bottom of the rosette. It, it's, there is a numerous ways of different, different things that you can do. So not only there, the shape of this piece here is what you're talking about. That's right, that's the rubber. Keep talking, John. I'll take me a couple minutes here to. Don't ask me more questions. I'll get confused here. Well, you talk. You talk and answer questions, okay? I'll be cutting over here. Okay. The reason I'm wearing my safety glasses is I sharpened one of these here cutters and I thought I could do it without doing it the way I'm going to do it right now. I just keep spinning it and it would work like a champ. Well, about the second time this cutter hit the wood, the end of the cutter disappeared and I have not found it yet. I, and I was turning probably 10,000 RPM so it probably went a pretty good long distance in my shop. And I was thinking it could just have been as well lodged in my eye. So I wear safety glasses just because of that. It was a one of them things that was a lesson learned. 
Okay, what I'm going to do is cut a basket pattern, basket weave, okay? Over here, I have a stop that I'm going to use to control my depth. How's that? Is that okay? Okay, I talked earlier about using an in, having an indexer. I'm using my rosette as an index. My rubber is going to the, to the uh, fitting into the valley of the rosette very carefully, and I'm going to simply do it like that, make a cut, pack it out, rotate it, make another cut. That, that's called indexing. And this stop is going to allow me to get them to the, to the cut so they all be the same depth without having to come back and read the little dial here. Okay, I think we're ready. Okay, here we go. I'm going to assume that's about the right depth right there. I'm going to back it out, move it one notch, crank it in. So why do you not use this on an automated run? Would it keep I think it's, it allows the cutter to advance into the wood too fast. Okay. And I uh, say when it broke, that got my attention. I just don't, I, I can, that's why it broke. I, I was going in way too fast. Okay. Now I'm sure you can do it the other way, and other people do, but not Dan Henry, okay? You know, you've heard the, uh, the, you know, if you talk to five woodworkers, you get six answers. Well, here we are, that was the sixth answer there. Are you seeing the pattern emerge yet or not? And this is a, an example here is when it's threaded on there, it's not quite centered. So I got to go just a little bit deeper all the way around to make it work. It's, this wood is okay. When, it, when I threaded it onto the shaft, it's not perfectly centered. Okay. Threads are your worst enemy. What's that? Oh, you think a bit more accurate if Fred would made it? Okay, now what I got to do is I got to move this 125 thousandths of an inch this way because this cutter is an eighth inch cutter, eighth inch to 125 thousandths. Okay, there's 50, there's 100, and 25, and I didn't have quite all the slack out of it. Okay, now I want to do a basket weave. So I want, the, the, my, I want my points to be in the middle of the valley. So I got to come over here and change this over here. I'm going to phase it. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah, exactly the same thing. You're right.
Well, usually you, you go 50%, which that would put the point in the center of the valley. That makes sense? If you, go, if you, can, you can phase less than that. In fact, on my big machine, I've got one that's got 96 little indexes, and they're only less, maybe 3 sixteenths apart, and so you can get them really closer together. But you, there is a, a, a set of holes in this here for each uh, number of rosette disc you have. You don't want to put, use a 12 uh, holes for a 24 or, or vice versa. You want to use these holes as drilled so that, they're, so that the holes are 50% apart. Okay. That makes sense? I went to Phoenix a couple of years ago to a, a symposium, AEW symposium, and in one room there was nothing but going going was ornamental turning. Well, David Lindau was going to set up to do a, a, a vertical piece with a pin, and he fooled with it probably 25 minutes. If you ever heard the name Gorst de Please, he is a very famous ornamental turner who is dead now, unfortunately. He sat back there in the audience and he finally said, you know, David, this is exactly the reason most folks don't get into ornamental turning because it takes too long to set something up. And he was 100% right. It does make a little difference. Okay, I, I, I moved this 50%. Tell me if my light is okay. Okay, here we go. Dummy. Wrong handle. Well, first of all, it's not going to hold good detail because it's going to be it's going to fudge, okay. and more than likely it'll warp and it will, you'll lose your your detail or crack. So you really want to use dry kiln dried wood or stabilized wood. You can take some pretty punky wood and stabilize it, but also I would I would recommend that you don't take highly figured wood and, and try to ornament it because your f ornamentation is going to get lost in the, in the grain. Where a lot of reason people a lot, a lot of folks use black wood is because it has no grain to speak of and it holds great detail. Pass that around. And what about like Corian and things like that? Corian works great. Corian and most plastics do quite well. So it's it's a choice of wood is important also. But you, uh, using a wet wood just isn't a good idea because it's going to do things that you're not going to like. Whereas if you use kiln dried wood or something that's pretty dry. And, you'll, and it's got not a whole lot of grain to it. Uh, this is Bradford pear, and Bradford pear is a great turning wood for regular turning. But if you stabilize it, it really is not. What I mean stabilization, when you put it, use cactus juice. Are you familiar with that? Where you soak it in cactus juice, cook it, and then you uh, turn it. And you've actually infused plastic into the pores of the wood. And it makes it very, very stable. But it's got to be very dry to do that. You can't stabilize wet wood. It has to be dry. Okay, 
this is the this is what I wanted to show right here is is the pattern. I didn't get this quite set. I, I messed up and turned the wrong knob over here, and I didn't have it zero, so I, I lost my place. Uh, now what? Oh, can you come in from this side? And zoom in on. There you go. Zoom in on now. That's your zoomed. And that's the same pattern you had on. That. Exactly right. That that is a basket weave pattern. Okay. And and you say you can do this so it becomes a chevron color, a, a pattern, or you can do it. Uh, just keep going and and like this piece right here. This was just zigzagged back and forth. The exact same thing as this here is going to turn out. This in here is on an oval box, and the, and I made a jig to go onto the headstock of my lathe and allowed me to do a basket weave on the uh, oval piece. Uh, I've always wanted to decorate an oval piece, and this was, uh, I was with my new jig, I was able to do this. If you look at it very, very closely and get your micrometer eye out, the, the pieces of this, the this length of the basket on the side is not quite the same as the basket on the end. But if you don't look that critical, it looks pretty nice, you know. It's, you know, it's, it, if you hand this to an ornamental turner, it's, well, blah, 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 it's off here, blah, blah, blah. But if you give it to someone who's not an ornamental turner, say, this looks pretty nice there, Daniel. So, <laughs> and this on the end here, that is a uh, barley corn. That takes this little tool right here. And you adjust the circle, the size of the cutter to make those, that, that, those are just a series of cutters, a series of cuts. There's 24 cuts in there. And you, it's just the same thing. You use the indexer here to position. You crank your cutter in, crank it out, move it, just keep doing it all the way around. And it makes... Are you sure you didn't do that with a spiral drill? No, I'm pretty sure I didn't. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's one of them things that really look unique, but it's not that hard to do. Because it's... If this, getting the diameter cut is not that critical. It's just as long as it looks pretty, you know, but in relation to the center and to the outside. Now, when you're doing a barley corn going around the outside, there is some math involved. So now you want those little bitty circles to just touch all the way around. You do one set all the way around, then you come back and you phase it 50%. So now your circles are still touching, but they're overlapped. That makes sense? And it's, it creates a very pretty pattern. But you've got to do some math to do it. You just, you, you've got to figure out what the diameter of this little circle is. Okay, I want to do 24 circles, okay? My piece is X amount of this, uh, diameter, okay? You divide the diameter by your number of pieces, and then you, that is your diameter of your little piece, and then you've got to set your cutter using these little dots, and there's a different cutter set for that. So once you get all done, you go over and you do a, a just a really, really light cut, say, yeah, I like that, and you go ahead and finish it. If you don't like it, you go back to the lathe and you turn that off. <laughs> so how long does it take to, to do a, like the triple layer box? How long does it take? Oh, oh uh, probably, two, probably two weeks. <laughs> okay. Is that like an hour a day, a couple hours a day? It's, hours this was done on a, a mini uh, machinist lathe. I put it on there, and I had to make three cylinders. I, uh, the inside actually was a, was a solid piece. When I glued it up, then I come back and turned, it, turned the uh, center out of it. But you had to make three cylinders so that they would just slide inside of each other. You know, just where you could slide it together. You didn't want it too tight. You didn't want it too loose. You wanted it so you could still have some glue in there, it, it's some epoxy glue in there. And that took a while to do that. And, but to cut the outside, that was pretty simple. I used the, uh, the, the rosette cutter or the... Uh, universal frame cutter and just cut down through it until I got to the, the depth I wanted. That, that was pretty easy. And there's naturally there's a flower and, and the down inside there's a flower. You can't always see it without the light here. I'll get it here. Anyway, there's a flower down in there. But the reason I could do that is because uh, the bottom was cut set separately and it was just set that in place and glued the same thing with the, uh, the top. It was just, it was done separately too. But that was a fun project to, to, to do it, to be, to be able to do it. That's, I don't like to do a hundred of anything. I like to do a couple of it, something different. And that's the, just the challenge of trying to do it. You may not ever do anything with it, but at least you, you know you did it. This little triangular shaped fen finial. Now that took a special disc, and I didn't have the disc, so I, may, I thought, well, I can make one of them. It took me eight tries to get one I really liked. I tried to... 
uh, mark it, and I couldn't get it close enough. And I finally just figured out if I use a scribe with a, 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 a compass, with his, scratched it, and I roughly cut it out with a bandsaw, and I went to my one-inch belt sander with a fine belt, and I sanded till I got it pretty darn round. It's off, maybe a scope here and there, but not much. But she set this up with that universal frame cutter with that triangular shape th uh, rosette on there. And a the cutter will go all the way to the bottom and come back out and go all the way to the bottom and come out. And you advance it maybe five or ten thousandths at a time. So you're making numerous, numerous cuts to get this in that shape. And you can do, if, if you're really clever, you can make this into a spiral. I've seen some of them. You, you have to do a, do a phasing in between each cut. Now, if you have the index wheel, it has a, what they call a worm on it, and you can turn a crank, and it'll, it'll move it three degrees. So it's, it, you, can, you can phase it very, very little. Simple, Simple very, very easy to do until you go, if you get which way you're turning it. Where's that there, little black disc? That, 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 okay, that right there, in between each cut, you have to change your, your cutting setup three times. Three, three different setups for each cut. And if you forget which way you're going, you have a oops. So I finally took mine and I took a blue tape and I put a Sharpie on it, turn it this way. Because I had that brain freeze, or brain fart, however you want to say it. <laughs> and, and I went the wrong way and it screwed it up. But, you know, you, you get to doing these things and you kind of, you get into a, a trance or, you know, you don't, you're, you're not thinking as clearly as you should be. And you really have to think pretty clearly most of the time. And I know lots of times that I think, boy, I know exactly how I'm going to do this. And you start doing it. I say, well, damn, that ain't going to work. So the best thing to do is shut the machine off, go someplace else, stop and think about it a while. And maybe a solution will come to you and maybe you call Jeff and said, hey, Jeff, how in the world do I do this? <laughs> But it's very nice to have somebody to talk to. When I started this, there was me, myself, and I, and that was it as far as ornamental turners. And slowly, there's been a group formed. We've got eight in a group right now that are all have, there's four of the Lindau machines and four other ones. And it's good to be able to sit down and talk once in a while and just discuss what we've done, what we'd like to do, and where we're going, and what we're, what's going on. And that's why we did this workshop back in May, and that really turned out quite well because it, uh, we had uh, L David Lindown, a guy named, uh, boy, uh, P uh, Peter Git uh, uh, Gertzel. He came from Washington State, and Peter's very good at this. And he has a made lay, so I don't think it's a money's a problem with him. But anyhow, uh, they, the, between the two of them, we had a great time because they showed us a lot of different things to do, and it was just a, just a fun weekend. Is there any questions? I, I just, hopefully I just wet your whistle. There is a whole lot more to this. If you're interested in, in getting more information, please call. Don't do it during next week because I won't be able to answer the phone. I won't be around. But the uh, first couple of weeks. I just want to put a plug in. You know, there's like eight of us that have been in the North Texas area that have been doing this. I think we're going to get together sometime in September. And they really are helpful because you get parts of this and you cook and things like that. It's really fascinating to me. So we get together and talk about different tools. And, and, and we're not trying to, and we're not going to try to play I Got a Secret. This They're open and answer questions. And uh, the goal is to try to get more people interested. You know, it's, it's not an inexpensive thing to do, but it's amazing some of the things that you can do with it. Any other questions or comments? Or I, I hope I didn't uh, confuse you with too many details and facts, but it's all part of it. So, you know, the more you... Well, that's a trade secret. <laughs> right, she might see this. So. <laughs> and I have made some of my stuff, and some of them I haven't. Uh, I, I kind of find it kind of fun to come up with an idea and pursue it and make something. It just like this these indexing plates down, and I did that. But I drilled the holes using the indexing portions of my uh, Lindau white machine. So it get, I had something to help me get started. Uh, somebody said something about making rosettes. 
And, and I, it's, you can do that, but to get them very precision, you almost have to have a CNC machine. Mark Duvall made this here rosette for me, and uh, we worked at it quite a while before it, it spit the machine, before it spit it out. And Mark worked on it a long time. It, it's, uh, you have to know how to run the machine and, and to make it really work well. This here is uh, African blackwood, and it's really a great uh, wood to turn. And this is a shell pattern using a, uh, <coughs> another gadget that goes on the lathe. And it's every, there are several cuts there, and each cut, you, you, if you don't get it set right, it's not going to come out right. You say that's African blackwood? That's African blackwood. Have you tried, like, ebony or the other dense wood, cocobolo, not cocobolo? Well, too, too much. Too, too, too much pattern to it. You, you really want something that, has, that doesn't have a lot of pattern, so not a grain to it. Plain, plain yes. Dense, wood, uh, dense hard wood, yes. Yeah, definitely. And you can take some wood that's kind of punky and stabilize them, and or, you know, just, you just put a layer of thin super glue over a lot of punky glue, uh, wood will stabilize it a lot. Thin super glue works, especially when, you, uh, when I cut threads. I can cut threads in some pretty soft wood, and when I get it shaped the way I want, ready for the threads, I'll run me a drizzle of super glue all the way around that, let it cure good, cut my threads, and before I change anything, I go back and run another layer of super glue in there, let it dry, and then run my cutter across it one more time, and it makes a pretty good thread, surprisingly, in some pretty funky wood. Super glue goes a long way. But you want to let it dry before you stick it together, because you may never get it apart. <laughs> And I did some, I did some uh, threading uh, just years ago with some olive wood. Boy, the olive wood smells so good, feels so good when it's turning. That stuff warps so bad. I, I made some uh, box out of it. The next day, I couldn't hardly get the lid off. It, was, it, it warped that much just overnight. It was amazing. Pretty, but it smelled good. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you.